in Denver, our, our sports franchise, like we have lots of them, but the sports franchise that we follow is the Denver Broncos. And what position have we really struggled with with the Broncos over the last few years? <laughs> quarterback. Yeah, for sure. Quarterback. So we, the last three years since Peyton left, we've had four different quarterbacks. Here they are. Trevor Simeon, and they, it's what's interesting is most of them have been the starting guy a couple times. So Trevor was the starting guy a few times. Paxton was the starting guy a couple times. Brock was with Peyton, and then he came back. He was the starting guy for a little while. And then we had Case Keenum last year. Um, and, and unfortunately, none of them have really taken off. They haven't, it hasn't gone all that well. And so a few months ago, we received some good news. I would say it's good news that this guy signed with us, Joe Flacco. And, and everybody greets Joe with tempered excitement. But the truth is, we want Joe to work out, don't we? I mean, we want him to do well. Because if he does well, then we win games, they go to the playoffs. And then you got Drew Locke, who's, you know, he'll probably be good, but he needs a couple years to develop. So we want Joe to work out, at least for a couple of years, okay? But Joe said this when he was asked the question about his success. This is what he said when it came to him being successful and the team being successful this coming season. When you're new, and I am, there's a lot that can be accomplished. You can, be, you can have confidence that, that can carry you through the season as a new quarterback and naturally a leader on a team. The first thing I want to do is to prove to the guys on this team that I can be their quarterback. If they really have faith that I am the guy, and I believe I am the guy, that's when leadership can take off. And the point that Joe is making there is that his relationship with the rest of the team um, their success as a team, the playbook that they have getting executed, their game plan, is directly connected to the faith that the team will have in him. In a very similar way, that, that's some of what we're talking about through this sermon series on Heroes of Faith, is that our relationship with God. And maybe right now your relationship with God seems strained. It doesn't seem like God is there. You're wondering if there even is a God right now. That you're wondering this, what exactly is God's plan for your life. You're wondering, you know, why is there such a mess around me? So much of that comes back to and will come together on and the, the playbook that God has for your life in the midst of his great plan, it's going to come back to the amount of faith that you have in him. For many of us, unfortunately, we relate probably a little too much to the man in Mark chapter 9 that Jesus interacts with there. This man had a son who was often gripped by seizures. And this condition of his would cause, take him to a place where he wanted to take his own life. As, as he would tell, as the story is told of him, he would throw himself into fires to, to end his torment. The father ran to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, if you can help us, have mercy on me. Have per compassion on our family. Heal my son. And Jesus said, if I can, with the question, as a question, if I can, if you believe, all things are possible. The father had a classic response. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. And many of us have some unbelief right now that needs to be dealt with. That maybe that we are struggling with. That we're taking steps, but we're running into dead ends, and things just aren't working out the way that we want them to. It seems like there's a mess, there's chaos, and there's no calm in the midst of the chaos. And right now, our faith is a bit, it's a bit weak. It's tempered. It's not what it once was. It's not what it could be. Or maybe even where it's at, you're not necessarily struggling, but you're saying, you know what, I want so much more faith than what I've got. With that in mind, we're going to go to Abraham in the Old Testament. And what we're doing in this series, actually, is we're, we're, we're allowing Hebrews 11 to be an inspiration for us to go from Hebrews 11 back into the Old Testament. And in that, we get to see how the Old Testament and New Testament connect. But we get to see the stories of these great heroes of faith. And hopefully, through that, maybe our faith can be strengthened. And faith is incredibly important to God. Hebrews 11, verse 6, says this, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And why is that? Because it's sort of this requirement, a little bit, but that's not what they're getting at, because if you don't have faith, then you won't believe that God exists. And if you don't have faith, then you won't earnestly seek Him. And so without faith, it's, it's impossible to please God. So what does Abraham teach us about faith? 
I'm going to share with you three moments in his life. And with these three moments in his life, we're going, to th- we're going to learn three lessons that we can apply to our life to strengthen our own faith. And we're going to pick up in Hebrews 11, verse 8 through 10, as we learn of the first, this first moment in Abraham's life. And by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And so Abraham was told, you need to go to Canaan. He was told that he had to leave. He had to leave his, all of the security, everything that he ever knew. He had to leave national security, relational security, financial security. He had to leave it all behind, take this step of faith. And he knew that's what God wanted him to do. He just didn't know where it would take him. The first step in strengthening our faith is that we have to be willing to act without knowing the outcome. And the action that we take has to be obvious. It's it's not like we're guessing. It's this very apparent thing that we know that we need to do, that we know that we have to do, that in the end we'll look back and say, oh yeah, that made a whole lot of sense. Pastor Derek Johnson defined faith this way. Faith means believing in advance what only will take place and will only make sense in reverse. I took a year off at, from college after, my, after I finished up my bachelor's degree. I took a year off to do some soul searching, to figure out what God wanted me to do. I had planned up until that point to be a teacher and to coach basketball. That's what I had always wanted to do. But after I became a Christian, I felt like I needed to recenter myself to really try to attempt to discover if that's what God wanted me to do. Through the course of that uh, journey, I became involved in a college ministry. And this college ministry that I was a part of, for some unknown reason, allowed me the opportunity to preach. And so I got to preach my first sermon with them. And as I was, as I was uh, preparing for this sermon, I found myself praying, God, help, help the lost to be found and help the saved to be sanctified and to grow and people to be excited about Jesus and lives to be changed. It's incredible stuff that happened through this sermon. I prayed for something great to happen for them. I wanted the sermon to be for them. But after I, I preached that sermon that night, I realized that that sermon wasn't for them. And there are two reasons. One is because the sermon was awful. It was just terrible. I mean, there was no one being saved. I mean, there was no one getting closer to Jesus because of that sermon. It was just really bad. But the second reason that I realized that sermon really was more about me in that moment was that there was this flame inside of me that was fanned that I didn't know existed. And at that point, I realized I need to start praying because I'm either going to pursue teaching and coaching or I'm going to go into ministry and see if there's a vocational opportunity out there for me. And so I prayed and prayed, and I talked to friends, and I sought uh, wise counsel, and I thought through it. And, and one night, I found myself in my room just praying and praying and praying about this. And, and I, I remember saying the words to God, like, God, I need an answer. I have to do, I have to make a decision. I have to make a decision. And so God, in my opinion, seemingly placed a question on my heart in that moment. And the question, as I was entertaining these two options, was this. If you were to die in the next month, what would you do? Teach history? Coach? Or preach? And do ministry? The answer was very obviously, do ministry. Go back to Bible, go to Bible college, go back to college, pursue a degree at a seminary. And that's exactly what I did. I moved forward in that route. It was an act of obedience. I knew the step I had to take. I just, I didn't know where it would take me. And here's the catch to it is I had, all, I had connections. I had a network. I knew if I moved down the teaching, coaching route, I knew where that would take me. I knew what that Canaan, so to speak, looked like. But down this other path, I had no idea. I didn't know that we would live in Dallas and live in Tampa and, and, and we'd, be, we'd be settling down here in Denver, Colorado. I didn't know that. I, I just knew that I wanted to lead a church, and I wanted to preach, and at some point, I assumed that that would eventually work out. And maybe right now, you're in a place where, you know, it feels like God has put something on your heart. And he does this in different ways. Maybe you're fortunate enough that you'll hear an audible voice. Maybe it'll be an impression on your heart. Maybe it'll be a godly mentor or friend of yours that speaks truth into your life. 
Maybe it'll be studying the scriptures, but somewhere along the way, you'll know what that next step is, and you have to be willing to take that step when you know it, even though you may not know where it takes you. And maybe for you, the step of faith, maybe you're a high school senior, and maybe right now the step of faith is that you, know, you need to say, I want to go away to college. Or maybe you're a bit young in your faith, and, and God's saying to you, I want you to start tithing, even though your finances are a little tight. And, and you've got enough, and it's just a matter of faith that, you know, God wants you to do that. You know, see, if we hang on to all that we've got, then, then we, and we never are willing to release it, then we can't receive back what God would have for us. Maybe God's saying to you, I want you to go to Bible college or seminary to pursue vocational ministry. Or maybe God's saying to you, you know, I want you to break off that relationship with a non-Christian, and you don't know where that's going to take you, but right now they're pulling you down more than you're pulling them up. Maybe God's saying to you, I want you to go to a rehabilitation center to get treatment. And you're struggling with an addiction. And you need some help. Maybe God's saying to you, I want you to homeschool your children. Right now, this public school thing isn't working out. Or maybe God's saying to you, I want you to stop homeschooling your children. I want you to send them to a public school because right now, they, they need some exposure to other kids and other environments. Maybe God's saying to you, I want you to move out of your parents' basement. You're 40 years old. God's saying that you just need to take a step of faith. And that will stretch you if you're willing to act in obedience, even when you don't necessarily know what the outcome will be. The next moment in Abraham's life that was so critical was, when, was right after God gave him a promise that he would, have a, he would have descendants as numerous as the stars. Yet he was 75 years old when he received this promise. Sarah, 65. Ten years pass. And through the course of that time, um, no child came. And they felt like they needed to take things into their own hands as they waited. Maybe God had a different plan for them that was a bit unconventional. And so Sarah makes this unconventional proposal to her husband, Abraham. And I'll read to you as their names will be once God changes them. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. And so she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah's wife took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And through this um, child uh, that would be born, his name is Ishmael, there would be incredible tension and strife and turmoil, division that would be created between Abraham and Sarah in their home between the children, Isaac, um, who would later come, and Ishmael. Uh, and then out of Ishmael actually is where Islam gets its, traces its lineage back to Abraham. They go through Ishmael and gain credibility to get to Abraham in that way. Since Ishmael came into this world, there has been consequences that have been negative. And that's often what happens when we're unwilling to wait on God. There's consequences that come about as a result of that. But eventually a child would be born, and this is what Hebrews chapter 11 says of Isaac. And by faith, even Sarah, who is past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And the lesson that we learn here from Abraham is this, from this moment in his life, to wait on God and not take matters into our own hands. And it's hard to wait on God. But I'll tell you when you know when you're not waiting on God. You're exhausted. You're worn out. You're constantly trying to manipulate situations. You're trying to manipulate people. You're trying to make things happen on your own. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And, I mean, can you imagine how exhausted Abraham was as he was working through the tension and the struggle and the consequence of this child that was born to him? I mean, not to mention he was just going to be tired in general. I mean, the guy, they, they had a very unique dynamic going on there. You know, they get their Social Security check, and then they're paying the maternity bill with the Social Security check. I mean, it's, whew. It was, a, it was a lot happening with it. But they weren't willing to wait. But when we are willing to wait, our strength can be renewed in that. And maybe for you, you're waiting on a spouse to love you. And you're just waiting. 
Maybe you're waiting for a medical test to come back negative. Maybe you're waiting for a pregnancy test to come back positive. Maybe you're waiting for loved ones to come back to their faith. Maybe you're waiting for children to finally come to faith. Maybe you're just waiting on what's next. You don't know what that next step is. You know something's next. It's where you're at right now isn't where you're supposed to be. Something's next and you're just waiting on that next thing. Maybe you're waiting for a vision to finally be fulfilled. This church was built in 2004 with the idea that by 2007, this development at Sterling Ranch would break ground and would start expanding. But about then is when litigation and lawsuits began to happen and months turned into years that turned into ultimately a decade before they would break ground. But Gene Barron and the leadership of Valley View Christian Church, they had a vision. And they, they wanted that valley to be reached for Jesus Christ and they wanted a church here to be ready for that when it would happen. But sometimes you have to wait for those visions to be fulfilled. And many of them are still here today and they get to see this vision beginning to take place. Many of you are a part of that vision. Like you, are, you have moved into this area because of that development. And the, the leadership of our church and the pastor of this church for so many years, he saw people coming and he knew that he wanted this church to be here when that day finally came. But sometimes you just have to wait. Wait in this life and even wait sometimes for the next life. A friend of mine Dave shared that when he was five years old, he walked into his living room, and there he found his mother crying. He said, Mommy, why are you crying? She said, The doctor just called me. Your Uncle Greg is never going to be able to walk. He had muscular dystrophy. He had been born with that. The treatments and, the treatments and the surgeries that he had gone through, had, there had been optimism with them, but it didn't work out. Uh, nothing ever really took. And so Greg was never able to walk. And so his mother said to Dave, she said, he, she, uh, she said to him, I'm sorry, he's never going to be able to walk. And Dave responded, never? And she said, never. And Dave responded, well, not even in heaven? And through a bit of a smirk and the tears, she said, well, I guess he'll walk in heaven, won't he? And today... Greg is doing that. He's walking, he's running, he's skipping, he's jumping. But they had to wait. They had to wait for that day to come. I hope that what you're waiting on comes to pass. I hope you get the job offer. I hope the pregnancy test comes back positive. I hope your kids get their acts together. I hope all of your family comes to have a vibrant faith in Jesus. But sometimes that doesn't happen. And sometimes the marriage doesn't get better and sometimes the children never believe in Jesus or the grandchildren. And sometimes you live pay to, paycheck to paycheck your whole life. But here's the thing. When we have been there 10,000 years, and we are in this city with the foundations that God has built, I believe that we'll look around and we'll see that, you know what? It was really all worth it. The last lesson that we learned from Abraham comes from Isaac. And God comes to Abraham and he asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, his one and only son. This is what it says in Genesis 22 2. And then God said, Take your son, your only son, who at this time is a teenager, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Abraham doesn't fight God. He doesn't resist. The next morning, Isaac and him awake, and he places wood on his son's back to carry up to this altar. And they begin this journey up the hill, this mountain known as Moriah. And when they get to the top of the mountain, it's hard to know exactly what their interaction was like, but they're both there. And the text says this, and when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. And while the text says that he bound Isaac, Abraham at this point would have at least been 115 years old. Isaac is allowing him to bind him. Isaac is laying his life down on this altar, on top of the wood that he carried to the top of this mountain. And then he reached out his hand and he took his knife to slay his son. And so, so this is actually the first place in the Bible that the word worship is used. And so here is Abraham with the knife held back. And one of the most glorious interruptions in all of the scripture, he 
the angel cries out, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Abraham replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. And Hebrews 11 describes this moment this way. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. And what we have here is a foreshadowing. It's a forecasting of Jesus. That there would come a day when, when Jesus would have to carry a piece of wood across, up a mountain, the same mountain. It wasn't known as Moriah then. It's what we know of, know as Calvary today. And they would climb, Jesus would climb this mountain with this wood on his back, and whenever he would get to the top of the mountain, he would roll over on the cross. He would lay his life down. In the same way that Isaac laid his life down, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. And so he lays himself on a cross. And when the Roman soldier would pull back the hammer to nail the spikes into his hand, there wouldn't be an interruption. In the case of Abraham and Isaac, there was a ram that was caught in the thicket that would become the sacrifice. But in this case, there wouldn't be a ram or a lamb. Jesus would be the lamb, the slain and sacrificed lamb for us that the book of Revelation would one day say we will worship as the slain lamb now stands. It was a foreshadow of Jesus who would come to us one day. And the lesson that we learned from this in regards to faith, because really what we're struggling with here is does God love us or doesn't he love us? Because he's, is he going to give us what we want or what we feel like we need? Is you have to look intently at the love of God that is displayed on the cross. And when we do this, our faith is strengthened. And we need to be more like Joseph of Arimathea, who after he saw everything that Jesus went through, he's this prominent member of the Sanhedrin, after he sees everything Jesus has gone through, he goes to Pilate because he had access to him, and he says, just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. But we struggle with that. Because we're saying, you know, give me Jesus, God, and I know you love me through Jesus, but I also know that you'll love me if the marriage and the money and the job and my kids' faith and everything else works out. And, and we come to God with that mentality and I think that God looks back at us and he says, I, I can't give you any more. I've given you everything. I've given you my one and only son, whom I loved. And when we see that love on the cross that he displayed for us there, our faith will have no choice but to be strengthened. And that's when we can find calm in the chaos. That's when the playbook starts to come together. That's when the life starts to make sense. That's when our relationship with him is really strong. So as we strengthen our faith, we need to be reminded. We gotta act without knowing the outcome. We need to wait on God and not take matters into our own hands. And above all else, we need to look intently at the love God displayed for us on the cross. Let's pray. We'll continue to worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for what you've given us in Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be inspired by the love that you've displayed for us there. May we open our hearts and our minds to tap more into what your cross means to us. God, for those of us who are waiting, let us not take your silence as a reason to move forward, but let us wait a little longer and renew the strength that is within us to stay faithful. But for those of us that you have made that next step obvious, God, give us the courage and the boldness to act. And may it all be for your glory. In Jesus' name.